The government's big new Agnipat scheme facing its Agni Pariksha across the country with hundreds of youngsters coming out in protest. The services determined to push ahead, believing that this is in the best interests of India's armed forces. To understand the thinking within the government, within the armed forces, behind the conceptualization of this scheme, I am joined in South Block this morning by the Chief of the Indian Naval Staff, uh, Admiral Hari Kumar. Sir, thank you so much. I am told that this is your first television interview since you became Chief, so I am deeply appreciative that you could take out time. Thank you for this important conversation. I want to start by asking you, sir, about the kind of reactions that we are seeing from Bihar to Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh to Haryana over the government's new Agnipat scheme. Why, as the Navy chief, as somebody involved in the conceptualization of this scheme, do you believe that this scheme is in the best interest of the armed forces? Of course, I believe that this uh, scheme is in the best interest of the armed forces. Uh, the scheme that has, uh, uh, I think, uh, come of age, it is a scheme which uh, was long overdue. Uh, this, uh, what is the origin of the scheme? You know, uh, the uh, Cargill Committee report had in its recommendations, you know, suggested that the armed forces uh, need to have a much more uh, younger age profile in consonance with the other armed forces of the world. So, this has been there since then and numerous reports have uh, sort of strengthened this uh, aspect of it. And uh, while uh, we have been working on it, you know, it is a, this is a transformational change and any change is not easy to uh, implement, it is not easy to decide upon. So, uh, so with this uh, almost two years of uh, planning has happened uh, in this uh, scheme. We have tried various options. We have uh, examined the models in uh, a whole lot of countries. and uh, But we have determined that we need to reduce the age profile. Well, the age profile was around uh, 32 years, uh, which is considered to be a little higher. And we are looking at reducing it to about uh, 25 or you know below 25. Now, one of the concerns these protesters seem to have, and I was speaking to a few yesterday, is that char sal kya jobless. Now, that's the one big overriding fear. That the whole idea of coming into an armed forces position is that you work really hard, you get through, you work for 15 years, you take care of the nation, and then the nation takes care of your family. That's the whole ethos behind wanting to join the armed forces for a typical jawan. Now they are concerned that 75% of them will essentially be jobless at the end of four years. How do you address this concern? No, you have to see what are the, uh, what are the benefits of the scheme. In the sense, uh, it is a scheme which is help, helping to modernize the armed forces, make the uh, profile of the armed forces much younger. And at the same time, the, uh, the uh, uh, society and the nation is benefiting from this because uh, you imagine a, a soldier who joins, an Agnivir who joins, you know, at the age of 17 and a half, he joins, he's trained, he's, uh, he brings in uh, his uh, bit of youth and vigor and vitality that is required for the services. And at the same time, he undergoes training, experience, he does, uh, you know, he gets tremendous exposure. For example, whether it's in the Army, Navy or the Air Force, the type of technology that he gets exposed to, whether it's a tank, whether it's a ship, whether it's an aircraft, uh, he works on all these things, he operates. And uh, today, the technology has changed so much that, uh, the, for example, on a ship, the combat management system is more like, you know, uh, how you use a, you play a video game or uh, the panels are like that. The uh, the buttons, the mouse, the keypads, they're all quite similar to, you know, a smartphone and uh, so on. So, there is a complete technological change, which uh, the modern day uh, Agnivir will definitely be able to hack it in much faster time. No, sure, and, but that's uh, yeah. for four years. Yeah. Their concern is what happens after the four years when 75% so, of them don't get regularized so, in the armed forces. So, firstly, the armed forces is not a employment generation scheme. It is a service. I mean, you join because uh, you are patriotic, you join because you want to uh, serve that country, you join because you want to do something for the nation. Nation ke liye kuch karna hai. No, that is what the, uh, the ethos of this whole scheme was. 
to ensure that you know we build a nationalist ethos among the, uh, the uh, youth who serve for four years they are empowered they are educated they get uh, you know enriched they get a seva nidhi and then when they go out he is uh, i mean he is very young at that point of time If, imagine joining at 17 and a half you are when you are going out you are only about uh, 22 and that age uh, the world is uh, yours you have uh, the you know you have educational credits with you to get a complete your degree you can uh, you have a uh, so working capital with you uh, your you got n number of uh, uh, benefits in terms of tangible and intangible uh, things that you've gained uh, intangibles you know leadership qualities uh, time management uh, discipline uh, you know uh, your personality uh, how you speak how you conduct yourself uh patriotism uh the uh, ability to work hard you know face challenges so whole lot of uh, benefits have accrued to you uh, which really cannot be uh, you know even quantified but you would accept that in places like haryana places like bihar and several other parts of the country where there are martial villages people would join the armed forces generation after generation thinking that once you join you are taken care of for life that pact between the government and the armed forces on the one side and these youngsters and their families and their villages on the other that pact seems to be snapping that is the primary concern of those who seem to be protesting so here i want to ask you you know i will give you two aspects of it first is do you want an all india all class military or do you want a military which is only from a specific areas you know that is something you have to give it a thought the navy today i can tell you is uh, is uh, represented in 656 districts out of 773 districts of the country and we hope to make it 100% in the next few years how do you achieve it you achieve it if you have a scheme like the agnivir where you are now almost uh, you know tripling the number of people that you are going to take albeit for shorter durations but the aim is to have a agnivir from every block in the country shouldn't you want that or should you have everybody from from one village let's take the point that you made about all india all class now several of the paltans in armed forces are say mahar regiment or madras regiment or sikh regiment jat regiment uh, and they are organized around either religion or caste and a lot of military historians when they are noting down accounts of military battles say that the military cohesion that esprit de corps came because of social cohesion uh, cohesion now this idea that you have one india one class uh, takes away from that construct a lot of military historians including captain amrinder singh actually raise questions about whether that move away from the way units and paltans are organized currently uh, is a good idea how do you justify it and why as of today i had uh, i had just uh, had a discussion with the army chief the army chief was telling me that you know almost 75% of the army is uh, all india all class you know they have and this uh, transition has been happening over a period of time there are still some pure battalions which uh, you know they will progressively look at how it can be made into a nationalistic which resembles the the spirit of india Uh, in the sense uh, of a uh, all india all class so but that probably may take time i don't i, I mean i it's i leave it to the army chief to comment on that aspect of it but since you raise the issue of uh, cohesion let me tell you cohesion you know if you uh, read a little bit about it there are two types of cohesion one is task cohesion and second is social cohesion what we should be looking at is task cohesion which is what you know you have to accomplish a task or a mission that is given to you what is the requirement for that the requirement for that is training working together uh, uh, the uh, quality of leadership the type of pressures that you are under the threat you face and so on but when you talk of social cohesion that is related probably to the time you spend together social cohesion is not so much important what we are looking at is task cohesion so i don't see uh, so much of an issue because uh in the navy for example we have all our ships uh, uh, aircraft and uh, submarines they're all combat platform now in these ships and uh, submarines when people are posted they are posted for 2 years at best 3 years and then they move on he moves on to a shore billet and then he moves on to another ship 
So you mean to say there is no social cohesion in these uh, task cohesion in these uh, units? They perform all the missions. They are combat ready. So uh, I want to debunk uh, this uh, myth that uh, you know this uh, cohesion comes only from uh, you know being together for a longer period of time. So one of the key ethos of the armed forces has been that soldiers fight together. because they are committed to the national cause and one concern raised by a lot of veterans is about whether 4 years is enough of a time to steep somebody in regimental ethos so that paltan ki izzat becomes his driving force because as a soldier goes for an audacious mission he needs to be convinced that the person next to him is as committed to the mission as he is how do you think having somebody on a four year service could potentially impact that does it impact that in your view how do you address this concern raised by a lot of veterans this this is what i talked of when you when you address uh, the previous uh, issue of social, of uh, task cohesion uh, if you look at how the military is organized you know it's organized from a set of 11 then it goes on to a you know a platoon then becomes a company then and the you know battalion and so on similarly in the navy we have something called a divisional system that's a number uh, 11 people are put together they perform under a, a divisional senior sailor and a divisional master chief so these people uh, these officers and the uh, senior sailor are supposed to guide motivate them you know look after them you know see their professional uh, grooming as well as any personal issues they have etc they they bond together they are together in work in play you know on board ship in their action post when they uh, do work in the 24/7 they are with them so that is how the cohesion comes in and uh, i would expect the same thing in the in the army as well because they are also organized on similar lines and uh, uh, if you uh, uh, if you have uh, you know come across uh, uh, something called the uh, figure of 150 it says the most uh, cohesive unit is a number it's about 148.6 uh, which is supposed to be the most cohesive uh, number the moment you exceed that you know it sort of uh, the cohesion starts so, no, so therefore you know uh, when you look at a, a company strength it's about you know uh, 150 that is how it is organized so when the people are there together it is i want to reiterate again that it's not the duration that you spend together that develops the cohesion it is the uh, it is the type of training that you go through the type of leadership that you are offered the type of activities that you participate in and you know the uh, the type of threat you face that is what brings the uh, sure no but i'm saying let's assume a commanding officer is to pick somebody for an attack on tololing or tiger hill would he trust somebody who's here only for 4 years as much as he trusts a lifetime soldier because the person who's here for 4 years may have at the back of his head the idea that i'm only here for 4 years after which i could be gone versus a lifetime soldier who knows that this is his sole mission in life to defend the territory of india and be a part of the armed forces does that then create a class among soldiers this is a lifelong soldier this is a four year conscript how do you say that uh, he is only uh, uh, not a lifelong soldier he is he's come for four years but you know he's got a very good chance of continuing now he is getting an option whether he wants to continue or he want to look for better jobs or you know uh, better opportunities maybe he he wants to only devote four years of his life you are not looking at it from the point of view uh, from the other point of view as to you know even today when we have these uh, you know our uh, sailors who join us there are many who don't uh, want to continue beyond a certain time so we have a policy that if in the first 2 years you are not okay with it then you can leave but many guys realize after say 3 years 4 years so then it becomes difficult then they have to continue till uh, you know 15 years of service and then only they can leave so here is an option for you try out the military life you know what you want to give to the country uh, uh, you know work hard uh, learn uh, new skills and if you find that okay you know i i want to do it only four years and i want to you know try some other uh, field or you know i want to do it my time so there is an opportunity for you Let's so you should see it as an opportunity rather than as a you know uh, as something that is uh, negative let's come to the issue of keeping 25% and easing out 75% of these agni veers can you share what the thinking is on how you pick the 25% and leave the 75% 
without allowing for subjectivity to enter the criteria for determination because in any acr that is drawn picking the top performers is relatively easy but letting go of 75% which is three in every four soldier is a much tougher ask how do you think the armed forces will achieve that without space for bias or subjectivity we are looking at a very uh, very transparent uh, system we are trying to harness the it uh, information technology to uh, uh, to drop the merit a uh, uh, agnivi from the time he joins he is going to be assessed for his performance at regular intervals whether he is uh, he is good at uh, weapon handling whether he is he has done his professional courses well how does he perform what is his attitude you know does he as he adapted well to the service way of life and is he keen on uh, serving and so on now this is uh, only uh, this is the major change here is that you know he has an option whether he wants to volunteer for for the service or he wants to go off Uh, just as the service has an option of you know selecting a guy or not selecting a guy so it is both ways you, you know the both the agnivir has also got an option whether he wants to continue or he want to look at you know other fields of interest or uh, you know he want to continue uh, in service and pursue a military career for the you know rest of his so uh, this option is a great thing that uh, he gets in my opinion no but if he doesn't want the option if he'd like to continue yeah. then he has to deal with the insecurity that he gets no pension because the one fear that a lot of people who are criticizing the scheme mm. have is that the government is trying to cut because of one rank one pension uh, defense uh, pension expenditure has gone up and therefore you are basically hoping to cut pension bills over a period of time by creating this kind of a mechanism for recruitment this uh, uh, that is i think pure conjecture i mean you can look at you know various uh, look at it from various uh, prisms to you know from financial angle and this angle and that angle but i think the, the uh, raksha mantri made it very clear that the government is not looking at it from the point of view of the uh, financial aspect in fact he had said to us time and again that uh, money is not an issue uh what do you money want for training because at some point of time we may we envisage maybe 4 years 5 years 6 years down the line our, our training infrastructure may have to uh, improve or to increase in capacity so uh, whatever money is required for modernization for uh, for uh, improving the training for making the soldier a technology uh, uh, you know adapt and technology enhanced you know, we are looking at ai uh, enhanced uh, soldiers sailors and airmen so uh, how do you achieve that that you know through uh, training bringing in new technology we are you're looking at using simulators emulators you know improve training processes and uh, so that he will be a, a modern uh, soldier sailor or airman okay now let's come to the issue of the roll out from here do you think to assuage people's concerns and to ensure a smooth roll out maybe a pilot project might have been a better approach rather than going the whole hog do you why do you think this idea of going for mass transformation might be better than a limited roll out just so that everybody is kind of comfortable with how the scheme is actually executed see i have been involved in the scheme for the last 2 years it just so happened that i was uh, the cisc and uh, you know deputy to general rawat and that is the time this uh, scheme was uh, being thought of in the drawing board stage and uh, and since then i've been working on it uh, for almost a year and a half i went off for my uh, commander in chief tenure in between and you know, i come back to see that you know the scheme had moved forward so a lot of deliberations had happened you know various options were examined and we were uh, we had discussed whether we should be uh, run a pilot project or should we not run a pilot project but uh, Uh, the the issue is that if you run a pilot project with a small number then at the, uh, immediately you will have two classes of recruits happening because for, you have to try out this pilot project for four years so the four years are going to have a, a normal entry and a new entry now this is uh, creating was creating a lot of issues for us because it leads to you know uh, how will you uh, adjust the seniority how will you adjust the you know the issues of pay Uh, the privileges and so on so therefore we had to have a clean break and then you know move ahead otherwise we would have just gone into uh, litigation and lot of other uh, you know That challenges yeah one of the lieutenant generals who was on my show raised the concern about how 
the CAPFs, the Central Armed Police uh, Forces, may become a preferred option because, in his view, 75% of the soldiers in the armed forces will be eased out, but in the BSF or the CRPF, you get to stay till 60. And therefore, they may feel that that is a more secure job and the best and the brightest may gravitate towards the CAPF in comparison with the armed forces. How real a concern is that? Uh, uh, firstly, I want to tell you that uh, the armed forces... Uh, we are quite distinct from the, all the other professions. And how we are distinct? By just one fact that we are required for ordered application of force under an unlimited liability. And this unlimited liability is what keeps us apart from all the other professions. Okay? No, nobody else has this unlimited liability to be uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, ingrained into the, uh, the thinking and your commitment to the service and so on. So, uh, uh, we feel that whoever has to join the armed forces has to join us. He's a volunteer. He joins us for the, uh, for the love of the service, for, uh, for patriotic uh, endeavors and for uh, learning new skills and giving a part of his uh, time, that is the day seva uh, option. So, now in this case, he is serving for four years and after that, you would have recently heard the announcement by the Honorable uh, Home Minister who said that uh, Agnivius will be given preference in uh, saying similarly, various uh, state governments have also made announcements that uh, they will be giving preference in the state police, armed police and so on. And uh, also, uh, we, uh, the industry uh, leaders have also uh, come out saying that uh, they will look at how to uh, facilitate the Agnivis. Uh, what the point, what we are missing most of the time here in this case is that uh, the Agnivi, you must remember, is a guy who's, uh, who's spent four years, gained so much in terms of uh, his, uh, you know, skills, his... Uh, confidence, his personality, etc. And then when he leaves, he's only 22, 22 and a half. And uh, he's got his whole life in front of him. He can pursue education, you know, to... But you have heard some of the him. veterans raising concerns hmm. that some of them could go, because they're militarized, weapon trained, could go down the wrong route and end up uh, in illegal activities because they may be jobless and frustrated. A lot of uh, concerns have been raised about them becoming anti-social elements or some, some element of them becoming anti-social. I think that's a very far-fetched and uh, very myopic view in my opinion. Uh, that uh, Because even today, uh, if, you, if you look at the total number of uh, personnel who are leaving, who are trained in arms, etc., I think it will be, if you combine the CAPFs and the, uh, the military, uh, it will come to close to 80,000 to 1 lakh personnel. Now, they are not all taking to arms. I mean, they all uh, pursue their, uh, take a profession, they do, a sense of discipline is installed, instilled in them, patriotism and uh, self-confidence and all that. So, uh, I don't uh, subscribe to this view at all. And uh, further, you know, they, in case of a national emergency, they are the ones uh, whom we can rely on to, you know, to... Uh, form the backup uh, in case there is an emergency and we require them either for disaster relief or uh, actual uh, combat operations, etc. We have trained manpower. We can. But let's come now to the problem with conspects. A lot of articles I'm reading raise concerns about what's happened with the Russian army in Ukraine, where the sense is that because the Russian army had so many conscripts and the conscripts weren't fully trained and fully motivated, therefore the Russian army faced a tougher time in the Ukraine war than it otherwise would. Essentially, the point that because they're not as trained as a lifelong soldier, is a conscript as capable in war as a lifelong soldier. And would that, once you have so many Agni Veers, would that be a concern for the armed forces? It is, uh, it is uh, too early to draw any conclusions on what is happening in Ukraine and uh, Russia. Uh, the uh, Many countries uh, do have a similar model of short-term engagement Correct. for personnel. And uh, it is not something new. It has happened in the First World War, it has happened in the Second World War, and uh, I don't want to delve into history. Many armies have done well, many militaries have done well. Uh, so, uh, I want to again say that uh, finally, the, uh, the armed forces work on uh, you know, good training, 
with leadership and uh, motivation, morale, cohesion, all these things. So, uh, I want to drive home the point that it is not really linked to how long you serve. It is linked to how much uh, uh, cohesion is developed in the, in the unit through uh, various methods which I talked of as a leadership, training and so on. And you don't think that's linked to time that you serve? No, I don't think at all. Because the more you are steeped in the ways of the armed forces, the more you imbibe the values of the armed forces. And the concern is whether, because about six months you are training, whether the two and a half, three years that you spend is enough time to get fully imbibed in the way of the armed forces. I don't know how, uh, you know, you are saying they are not, they're not being trained uh, adequately because even today, uh, a recruit who comes in, he undergoes a basic military training, which is 22 weeks uh, in the Navy, for example, and it's more or less similar in the other service as well, which is uh, he does a 20 weeks uh, basic training and two weeks training on board a ship. That is 22 weeks. Then he does a basic uh, part three qualification, you call it, professional qualification, which is about uh, four and a half, five months duration. That is the training which he does and then he continues. This next training actually happens after about uh, five years or six years. You know, so whatever he learns, he then he, he sort of consolidates on that and gains experience. The Aknivi also gets the same training. So he, we have, uh, in the Navy, we have reduced the training from 22 weeks, we have re reduced to 18 weeks, we have reduced it by 4 weeks. Because we felt that there were certain things which were really not relevant and in any case we are planning to reduce the duration. Similarly, so he does this uh, training and then he goes for a uh, part 3 qualification course, professional qualification course. He does that for about uh, four months and then he is on board ship, on board submarine, on board the aircraft. He does. So, I don't see what is the change. Admiral, uh, before I end, I have one last question. If there is some young boy or in the case of the Navy girl in some part of the country watching you on this uh, broadcast and wary of this scheme or has concerns, if you look into the camera, what's your message as Navy chief, as one of the people involved in conceptualizing the Agnipath program, what do you want to tell young India? I wanted to say that the Agnivir scheme, is, Agnipat scheme is one of the uh, most transformational uh, schemes for the uh, armed forces. It gives uh, opportunity for every youth to participate and uh, contribute towards uh, Desh Seva, uh, a little bit of your time, maybe four years in the service of the nation. Uh, come join us. Uh, Empower yourself, upskill yourself, uh, enrich yourself in many ways, uh, uh, professionally, uh, in, uh, face the challenges, become uh, confident, uh, gain so much of uh, tangible and intangible benefits and uh, thereafter you can take a call whether you find this uh, profession uh, to your liking or you want to do something better or different. So that is what uh, you should. Uh, is my message to you. It's a it's a uh, fantastic scheme, completely transformational, and uh, I don't think you need to worry about it at all. Uh, you should look forward to a very very bright future. Well, Admiral Lahiri Kumar, there were lots of questions and concerns people had about the new scheme. Uh, over the last several minutes, you were able to explain why you believe that these are. Yeah, that the program is indeed in the best interest of the armed forces. I thank you for taking our time and joining us for this broadcast. Thank you, Admiral Kumar. Thank you. Thank you. If you like the video, do like, comment, share, and subscribe.